And greetings. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova. Let me just check the audio now that we're live. And this channel is dedicated to exploring evidences and reasons for the Christian faith. I am a evangelical Christian with very reformed leanings. And I uh, nearly left the faith, uh, the Christian faith, 20 years ago, but was restored through the study of science. I have five science degrees, including a master's of applied physics from Johns Hopkins University, and a master's in equivalent in biology. For the last 20 years, uh, both in an amateur and a professional capacity, I have researched the creation evolution question. I worked for world famous geneticist John C. Sanford for seven years uh, while I stayed home to take care of my elderly and disabled mother who passed away last year. So uh, it's been a privilege to be able to explore this topic. Um, I was uh, um, an engineer and uh, senior engineer and, and scientist in the aerospace and defense industry. Somehow I ended up one wound up getting involved in the biology aspect that I really wanted to get involved in the physics and cosmology aspects at some point. That's one reason I went to graduate school. Uh, over, um, I'll, I'll recount some of the things that have happened in the last 20 years. But first I'd like to uh, offer a very heartfelt apology to my colleague, Jordan Kay. He was, uh, scheduled last week to present on Rada's paper, and I overstepped my time limit, my self-appointed time limit, and I, I totally lost um, 
I totally lost uh, track of the time. Uh, I ended up conversing with uh, John B, a geochemist, much longer than I had promised. I I got um, I felt uh, important not to let John B statements go unchallenged, and he would just counter, and that just kept going back and forth. And I I felt that I should represent the other viewpoint, uh, even though he was insisting quite strongly that uh, evidence was on his side. And I said, well, you know, it's only fear that I can't let that go. And so the conversation ended up uh, really mostly between me and John B. I did want to get around to uh, Jordan's K, Jordan K's uh, very um, dedicated investment and in time in uh, writing a refutation of uh, a Creation Research Society paper by Russell Rada, and I had commended it. And uh, since since I went over time, um, it it probably wasn't clear that I did want Jordan to continue. And just if I just had a few more minutes, I was hoping he would cover his paper. And uh, he ended up um, um, uh, he ended up feeling that uh, there wasn't going to be time for him uh, in that show. So uh, I feel very bad that uh, uh, um, that he may have felt disrespected, and that was certainly not intentional. Probably in the future, if he and I would dialogue on the internet, it might be better that I be on his show where he can control the, the time limits and he can express his viewpoints more freely uh, with me there if uh, people wanted to hear interactions. So sincere apologies to Jordan K. That was nothing intentional. And um, I hope we can continue a scientific dialogue, if not on the um, YouTube streams, at least uh, through the email channels. And we did talk a little bit about his fine work on Broadus paper. I had told him I will acknowledge his model and his criticism. And that um, at least for the time being, I will uh, I will go on the assumption that uh, Jordan's criticisms are correct, and I shouldn't use broadest paper. That being said, there were some other things to his model, to to Jordan's revised model, that I added even more suggested even more revisions regarding the absorption of uh, what they call neutrons. Um, neutron absorption cross sections for boron and sulfur and I will add even nitrogen and I know that's sounding real technical fast but I think this process is showing that the carbon 14 dating is subtle uh, I don't think either side can claim victory meaning I think both sides um, in regard to the young earth, issue are are scoring draws right now uh, each side will be declaring victory and i think both sides are a little bit premature obviously i am a young earth young cosmos creationist and i accept some of that by faith people say well don't you want to wait for evidence well i'm just saying well look if it's acceptable for a by the abiogenesis community and the evolutionary community to accept things on faith even though they insist they have proof on very close scrutiny, uh, many of their um, viewpoints are accepted on faith. And I, I'm quite happy to argue that with them. Uh, for example, eukaryotic evolution is mostly accepted on faith. It doesn't agree with statistics. And no one is, I, I don't think anyone's adequately refuted my points on that. Anyone who watched the James tour Take down to Dave Farina knows abiogenesis is in big trouble. So that being said, some may be wondering why I'm up late. I had overworked a lot. I got sick as a result, got tension headaches. I got a very bad case of um, B benign BPPV BPPV. It's a strange symptom, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, it's a problem in the left inner ear. The ears, nose, and throat doctor identified it as specifically the left side. 
and um, it is caused by canalith, magnesium crystals that are just floating around. And if they get agitated, oh my goodness, the room just starts to feel like it's spinning. And I just realized I had to take it easy. I ended up sleeping when I shouldn't have, and that totally messed up my sleep schedule. Oh uh, yeah, hi Harry Stark. Totally messed up my sleep schedule, and now I couldn't go back to sleep. So I, I decided that I would try. Uh, I tried to be productive, so I have been working a lot this week, overworking as I tend to do. Um, that's that's good and bad. It's, at least I'm trying. Um, and so I'm going to be covering more about nuclear physics and radiometric dating today and you know i let me just show this graph here and this isn't the most polished presentation i felt it more important that i break the lake um, have um breaking news published and then we can clean it up and dialogue and argue over it and then that's the time to make more polished presentations but let me show this graph. Again, it's not the most polished. It's not in presentation mode. In the 1970s, you know, I pretty much accepted the mainstream view. I was, uh, um, I became a Christian. I, I was raised in a Catholic home. I think around 1978, I became a, what would be called a born again Christian. Uh, just through study of the scriptures, uh, it, it changed my life forever, uh, especially reading the New Testament. But so I was raised in the public schools, uh, in a Catholic church, accepted evolution in long ages. After I became a Christian, I was a theistic evolution, and uh, I accepted that for about a year or two. And then I got a hold of a, uh, some publication from the Institute of Creation Research that talked about the impossibility of abiogenesis. And I said, well, this life really looks like a miracle. I don't buy, I don't buy that um, natural mechanisms created uh, life or the emergence of complexity. And so I became an old earth creationist for a very long time. And some th time in 2002, I had a crisis of faith. I began ex just exploring everything. And um, oh, greetings, Ian. Yes, I explained earlier, Ian, nice to see you um, earlier that I, I, I've been kind of uh, ill and sleeping strange, sleeping strange hours as the result of, you know, lying down, but now I can't sleep in the evening. So uh, greetings to you out there on the other side of the world. Great to see you. So I was just relating how I was a theistic evolutionist and then became a old earth creationist, a young earth creationist. And this is just kind of my personal viewpoint of how the level of evidence has changed over time. And so in 2002, I had my crisis of faith. I began to, you know, I began to just re-examine everything. So I just like, I don't know whether life's created or not. But by 2010, um, I was quite convinced that the universe required a miracle to build it, and so did the origin of the first life. And then um, miracles are needed for common ancestry. So, um, oh, yes, thank you. Yes, I'm feeling much better now. And now I can't sleep, which is really bad. So I tried, to, I said, I'll do a stream. Maybe uh, that'll get some burn off some excess energy. So we can define intelligent design as really kind of centering on these three green areas. So anyone who watched the James Tour series uh, where he just took Dave Farina to task, we'll see what I mean. That uh, for many of us, we're, we're quite convinced that abiogenesis now would require a miracle. And um, a, what I would say is, strong evidence of that is now that the mainstream community is invoking multiple universes that we can't see or test ever 
as explanations for abiogenesis. When secular mainstream scientists and scientists of high note like Eugene Koonin, and then also papers published in Nature are starting to say that, I'm just like, okay, this is indistinguishable from miracles at this point. Uh, amazingly, the multiverses are also used now to explain the fine tuning um, of the universe. So Ian asked a good question, and I'm sorry, I, uh, let me explain that for those who haven't seen this graph before. It, it's a graph I showed before, and I should, I should explain it. So let me try to explain it. The red means it's unfavorable to creation. Green means it's favorable to creation. So over time, I'd become more and more favorable to creation, particularly young earth creation. Each of the rows uh, symbolizes kind of the areas that are important to creationism and or intelligent design. So like the first row says, the universe requires a miracle. The, the second row is abiogenesis requires a miracle. The, the next is miracles are needed for, for complexity and common ancestry. So even if we assume common ancestry, um, I would argue that miracles are needed along the way. That's the viewpoint of people like, say, Stephen Meyer, and to not exactly the same degree, Michael Behe. He doesn't use the word miracles. He'll use the word intelligent design. There are problems. Um, I mean, if one wants to invoke special creation, there are uh, problems with what we call shared errors. And Erica and I and Dr. Dan could talk about that sometime. Um, I didn't believe human life was young. I had accepted at one point that it, he evolved. But now I'm starting, I, I definitely, especially after working with John Sanford, I think that's the case. The fossil record is another one. Is it young? Now, the harder questions is, can we prove this Earth and solar system are created or, and young? And is this cosmos young? Those are hard. But by 2020, some of the areas that I marked in red, it turned green. The gray areas I didn't even know existed, that they were... Uh, problematic. So this is my own personal assessment. And obviously people, um, you know, on in the YouTube sphere will have a different viewpoint. But the, if people ask me, why am I a young earth creationist? I feel that as I've studied this, the trend has been favorable, even if I can't complete, make all of the areas green. So intelligent design is roughly like, it covers these three. So if you if you believe in young earth creation, you automatically believe in intelligent design, but the converse is not true because there are many people who believe in intelligent design and believe the universe is old, and some will even accept common ancestry. But kind of in a very rough manner of speaking, and I emphasize rough manner of speaking, the, um, the Discovery Institute represents what I would call the old earth creationists. Now, that's not exactly technically true because Michael Behe does not classify himself as a creationist, but Stephen Meyer would, and I think some of the others in the Discovery Institute. So they're the old creationist camp, and then they're the young earth creationist camp. So I would, I would say really the battle is not um, between evolution and young earth creationism. It is between old earth creationism and young earth creationism. For those of us who believe, except intelligent design, that's kind of where I define the real battle. I, I actually feel that naturalistic evolution and especially abiogenesis has already been refuted um, on theoretical and empirical grounds. And I most of the first two years of this channel has been articulating the reasons why. Uh, interesting question. Darwin would be allowed today, would he accept ID and God? Um, let's actually, that's a good question because I have a quote from Darwin himself. So again, oh, just let me, uh, I'll, I'll take that point in a little bit there, Harry. But um, so you could see that that's young earth creationism. It has intelligent design and then things that are specifically 
questions for young Earth, independent of intelligent design. Um, let me just change the graph. Okay, so what Darwin said, um, one cannot look at this universe with all living productions in man without believing that all has been intelligently designed. Now, I've taken, unfortunately, this, this is a little hard to explain because um, Darwin's writing is not very clear and usually he'll, he'll, he'll say two opposing things in kind of the same paragraph. He went on to say that as far as biology is concerned, he doesn't see it. So he, uh, he ended up saying he's an agnostic because he said kind of in the grand scheme of things, it does look intelligently designed, but he looks at biology, he doesn't think it's intelligently designed. And then he has the problem of evil. And he said, I'm, I'm an agnostic. So I'm just, you know, uh, like a lot of people, they may hold two opposing viewpoints and hence like be undecided. And I think that's where Darwin was. He was not a full-fledged atheist. <clears throat> he identified as agnostic. And that passage there reflected like kind of the conflict. Yeah, on one on one side, he thought it looks all intelligently designed, and on the other, uh, quotes that I didn't include, uh, said he rejected it. So he's kind of caught in, in between. So uh, he did, there were some other things. Uh, he said, intelligent design has perplexed me beyond measure. And he did say the pro, in Origin of Species, the progenitor of innumerable extinct and living descendants was Created. Again, there are more subtleties to this, and the historians and biographers can cover that. So um, suffice to say, if, if you just took the quotes at face value, they, they are out of context uh, in as much as that he didn't, you know, he didn't actually endorse this 100%. It's more like 50% on one view, 50% on the other view. At least that's the way I categorize it. So thank you for the comment. Uh, oh, what a kind thing to say. So, um, yeah, and, and, and again, to be, you know, again, I'm emphasizing, uh, you'll, you'll have to read the vert, the passages in context, uh, just in the interest of space and time, I, I, ha, I, you know, I'm skipping over that. That would be a wonderful separate discussion. So I'm just trying to, in the interest of being fair, you know, don't, don't run away with those passages in isolation and, and you know, incite them. So going back to this graph, and it'll relate to the topic of the night. This is my view. Uh, if I revise the timeline a little bit, even by 2022, which is just two years since 2020, and then, you know, you could see my views in 2016. That's when I worked. Uh, I had some really important work with Dr. Sanford in the 2016 timeframe. By 2022, I'm more sympathetic. So the, the heavy dark green means I'm emphatically feeling that's the case. The, the lighter green is not quite as strong. Yellow means I'm not, I don't feel evidentially it's very good and, and red or pink means, yeah, it's, it, it's not good at all. So, so my views are changing and, um, so let's let's move on. Uh, you know, maybe I'm hypoth hypothesizing at some point it'll be all green, but that's just my feeling. So there has been a changing story of radiometric dating among creationists, um, and sometimes they were for it, sometimes they were not, and it's been changing. I have agreed with both Erica and others that the accelerated nuclear decay models by some young earth creationists could be in conflict with C14 dating. And I actually don't think, no, no, wait, that's not what Erica necessarily said. That's something I'm saying, but I am in agreement with Erica and Jordan Kay and others who are critical of young earth creationists that the accelerated nuclear decay would be disastrous. Uh, so, I have, you know, there's a minority that don't agree with it in the young earth community, uh, even among young earth creationists that endorse accelerated nuclear decay, they do acknowledge 
that it could cause uh, instant death, like, like the potassium isotopes in your body, if there were accelerated nuclear decay, it would kill you. So I don't like that explanation. And if we're tinkering with strong and nuclear, strong and weak nuclear forces, what happens to the stars if they blow apart? So I think the, the model on the whole is uh, problematic. Now, that being said, creationists obviously accept uh, miracles as an explanation for the origin and emergence of life and its complexity. So how do we decide when to invoke miracles or not? I would say when we feel that even from a secular standpoint, that something is highly improbable or uh, but but obviously it happened, that would constitute grounds for invoking a miracle. We don't just invoke miracles because we want to support the Bible and say, hey, if we put a miracle here, then the Bible is true. That becomes circular reasoning. So the problem facing young earth creationists is for origin of life, we'll accept miraculous explanations. For Noah's flood, by and large, they're trying to accept naturalistic explanations, for which would entail also radiometric dating. They want naturalistic explanations for the proportions of parent and daughter products that give an appearance of age. And then also for the problem of distant starlight, the young earth creationists, by and large, not all of them, are trying to accept naturalistic ex um, explanations. Oh, by the way, there, um, especially when I'm running the show by myself, I, I might miss a lot of the comments in the side chat. Uh, so if you really want a question answered um, or dealt with, I may not be able to answer it. Uh, you might just have to repeat yourself. So um, actually, I think God of the Gaps is acceptable. I, what I've asked people who are not um, who are not believers, what would persuade you of a miracle? And I said, okay, um, would it be a gap? And some said, well, no, I'd want scientific explanations. Although that comes as a problem because if we could run experiments that would create miracles on demand, then we would effectively be, be God. And um, so that th th there are all sorts of complications that, um, that come, you know, we tend to believe what we can understand and measure and comprehend. It's very hard to, you know, th there's a challenge in accepting miraculous explanations, especially the sort that we might not ever comprehend or understand. So it might be true, and yet it'd be beyond our reach to absolutely prove. And there's some all sorts of philosophical things tied to that. Unfortunately, even though that would be a great discussion, I can't go there. Suffice to say, I have felt that I've seen miracles in my life. I had a vision at a very young age, and I've had friends who've had that. So um, it, just at a purely personal level, um, it's easier for me to accept miracles. And um, also now that you know, I'm thinking that, uh, and we are talking about nuclear stuff, given that the world could, um, we could see how easy it is for a single tyrant with nuclear weapons to make a lot of trouble. And there, there's going to be more nuclear prol proliferation, and there'll be states like, say, North Korea that have nut jobs running it, and they have nuclear weapons, and they could hold the whole world hostage, just th threatening to detonate them. Uh, and you never know if they go just kind of crazy. Um, the prospects of continued civilization, it's really kind of scary. And uh, any number of people who are not believers have um, express concern that they don't think the human race could last long. So I know that's such a downer to be talking about that, but it it, it does put a perspective on, you know, our role in the universe and in the meaning of life. I mean, for me, you know, being comfortable is very important, but uh, kind of in the longer timescales, I would hope that uh, my life and everyone's life counts for more than just kind of survival for the next meal. So um, that's just a little bit um, 
I, I know I'm never going to get to the main topic and at this rate, but uh, uh, I, I appreciate the comments. So let me go on here. Now, one reason without invoking miracles that um, I accept that the fossil record is young, even though it's not proof, is a, is a graph like this. This is a, a graph related to the chemical states. And I had a whole show on this and I can't explain it now, but this graph should not have this slanted line. It should be a horizontal line. It is of the racemization states of fossils. The chemical dates don't line up. Even though um, we could change the chemical, the, the rate of chemical decay by factors of 60, which is a lot. The chemicals, the chemicals themselves can't be used to make an accurate date of how old the fossils are, but they can make a very good determination how old the fossils are not. So I, uh, I unfortunately, we don't have time to cover this. It'd be subject of another show but I covered this with a biochemist and organic chemistry professor, James Carter, and he and I agreed that chemical dates um, don't work, um, don't support an old earth, or, or at least an old fossil record, technically speaking, old fossil record. This is from my presentation back then, and I don't have time to cover it. Um, I found evidence uh, in papers uh, all the way back to the Cambrian explosion of chemicals that look very recent and i just don't have time to cover it guys but i'm just showing you just giving you a little candy of what that will be uh when i get around to it again uh that there is a show on this some somewhere back in the archives of this channel where i explain it more um you know some of the chemical dates out to like uh, in the billions of years just didn't look right um, and so with that, I said, okay, the, the problem then is it's not like we have no evidence of youth in the fossil record. It's we have conflicting evidence. We have the radiometric dates. The chemical dates say it's young. And, and that's a problem even Mary Schweitzer, a secular scientist who's a theistic evolutionist, is... It, when she found soft tissue and dinosaur bones that kind of rekindled the whole, the whole debate about the appearance of youth in the fossil record. And it's not just an isolated case, but the thing was, that was such a big find, it kind of sparked the whole question. But this permeates to all sorts of other fossils that are not quite as high profile or glamorous as dinosaurs. And so uh, either we revise chemical kinetics or we revise radiometrics. And um, 2012, I was in a solid state physics class. I was trying to save my grade. Um, we, uh, I and my peers often al alternated between being who was the top in the class. So some classes I'd be in the top and some classes I'd be in the bottom. Well, this is one class I was in the bottom of my peers. And I took a gamble. I said, I'm going to look at ways to change nuclear structure by a chemical or electrical means. So the young earth creationists want to account for radiometric dating that says old ages with accelerate, <clears throat> accelerated decay. I decided it would be better to look at alternative means of changing nuclear structure to account for the differing proportions, for the proportions of parent and doctor, daughter products that superficially suggest the earth and parts of the fossil record are old. And this is a more complex path. So I, in 2012, I uh, gathered all the data in the secular world that I could, made the presentation bef before the professor and my peers in class. We all had to present the final day of class. Each of the students would do a presentation on their term paper. The professor was really impressed with my work. And 10 years later, all of that evidence is even stronger now that we can change nuclear structure in ways we never dreamed of. Uh, at the time that I wrote that paper, I gathered, I had one 
powerful data point, which was the um, lightning strikes made neutrons. 2017, we did even better tests of this. We found out, yes, indeed, lightning strikes, electricity can change nuclear structure. The exact thesis that I had uh, put forward and defended and the professor thought I was correct. He said it was the topic of the night and it has since gone further. Um, so uh, uh, let me see now there was, I had another point I was going to make and I have since forgot it. So um, there are basically, this is kind of my categorization. There's high energy nuclear reactions. And what I mean by high energy, you need a lot of energy to get it started. Um, this is fully accepted. And there are new developments in the last 10 years regarding this. So this is uncontroversial. The low energy nuclear reactions or low initiation energy, there are, it's mostly controversial. There are some accepted examples of this. And then a category I just created today, I call it mixed energy nuclear reactions or meaners. So low, low energy nuclear reactions are leaners, mixed energy nuclear reactions are meaners. That means we have a mix of high and low in the same system. So this, this, this presentation I will call, uh, you know, I'll, I'll call it leaner and meaner nuclear reactions, leaner and meaner nuclear reactions, and we'll cover some of that today. Uh, this is relevant to young earth creationism. And some of these mechanisms could be conceivably uh, in play during the great flood of Genesis, Noah's flood. Um, and I'm going to cover some of that. And so some of the experiments right now are very lab laboratory controlled, but I think um, it's going to be interesting how well we could extrapolate this. And there have been some experiments uh, ranging from fully accepted to those kind of really definitely on the fringe that could apply to the young earth debate for sure. And the, and, and, um, you know, the supposed radiometric ages. So let me cover the traditional way of viewing changes in nuclear structure um, from external, not nuclear radiometric decay, but just changing nuclear structure, what we call what we would call transmutation. That is changing one atom to of one element to another. It's like alchemy, but it really does work. Let's look at this thermo. Okay, so th this is a high explosion of a hydrogen bomb, a therm what we call a thermonuclear weapon. And the reason it's called that is it, it relies on a lot of heat to, to trigger it. So what we have here is we have a chemical explosive here. And this is public domain. I'm not releasing any uh, government secrets. Um, you have a chemical explosive here, and then you have, um, and, 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 and somewhere in there you have uranium. Yeah, so, so you have this high explosive in the green, and then inside you have uh, uranium-238, and in the middle, uh, uh, plutonium or uran uranium-235. And so, when we, we we take a little bit of an electricity, we start off the chemical explosion. It force it, it it forces all the uranium or plutonium to merge together, and when they uh, merge together at high speed, it becomes uh, uh, it reaches critical mass, and it sets off um, an atomic explosion, a fission explosion. When that explosion happens, it it pours a lot of heat into this chamber here, which has um, the hydrogen and lithium. So when it says deuteride here, that's hydrogen. So it mixes lithium with lithium deuteride. And, and so uh, you get an even more powerful explosion. So this is an example of changing nuclear structure with fission. 
And then with lots of energy, we cause fusion, changing nuclear structure by a different mechanism. So the bomb, um, in a purely scientific sense, even though it's a tragic device, given it's designed to kill, it's really a weapon. It, uh, from a technological standpoint, it illustrates the two primary ways that we can conceive of how um, new atoms can be created and synthesized in new elements. And we, we, we speculate that a fusion reaction, it's analogous to the fusion reaction here uh, in the stars is what creates the elements uh, that make you and me. So they'll say, you know, uh, all of these elements are inside the stars or some reaction of the stars. I, I mean, were created through the stars or some reaction of the stars. There were supernova and they got reassembled and it gives us the, the range of elements here. Most of that is through nuclear fusion, uh, nuclear uh, stellar fusion. So now, Let's look at experiments. So for a long time, it was insisted by and large that fission or fusion are the only ways to really make stuff in quantity. But there have been since other experiments. Oh, now I remember what I wanted to say. Um, the first fusion experiment by um, Oliphant and Rutherford and one other scientist it did involve, it did have to be initiated by electricity. I don't know the entire means. So Ernst Rutherford, who's famous for elucidating atomic structure, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, actually participated in doing the first fusion experiment, which led, sadly, to the hydrogen bomb. But I mentioned lightning creates neutrons. In two, that was like a, a paper in the mid 1980s, and we didn't have a lot of data. But since then, since that time, um, 2017, we did some very good tests in Japan. We found lightning creates neutrons through what we call a photonuclear process. We found out we, we can change nuclear structure, not with fission or fusion solely but with electricity, electricity. It creates gamma rays in the, what they call the million electron volt range that can disintegrate the nuclei or cause neutrons to, to come out of nuclei of atoms. And I said, this is changing the whole, this is changing everything. Now I'll point to this picture here. Okay, so you see lightning there on the left, this one is what they call earthquake lights. <clears throat> this is still controversial to be fair, whether it's a phenomenon, but the American Physical Society, which is the premier society of physicists in the United States, is exploring this phenomenon. Some people have said, well, why does it seem like UFOs appear or strange lights appear when they're earthquakes? And it's disputed whether that's the case or not that we actually see strange lights, but we're getting more and more evidence Enough so that the physicists began to study this question, and they've concluded that all the tectonic pressure or activity or whatever you call it associated with earthquakes can generate electricity. And if it can generate large amounts of electricity, um, I think I've seen numbers for lightning, um, ordinary lightning being in the range of Correct me, anyone, if I'm wrong. Feel free to put it in the comment section. Of 300 million, 100 million volts. And if these, they have other things called earthquake lights, and they're examples of lightning from earthquakes that are claimed. If it's also in the 100 million volt range, that that's definitely enough to to change nuclear structure. So the hypothesis among some, a very small minority of young earth creationists, which would include me, is that rather than nuclear decay, all the associated tectonic activity is creating large amounts of electricity that can change nuclear structure. So what physical evidence other than, let, let, let's say, okay, 
as I said, you don't want to use the Bible if you're trying to defend the Bible because that ends up being circular reasoning. You can't say, well, it says it in the Bible, uh, therefore it's true. It's like, well, what makes you believe the Bible is true? One thing that would make you believe the Bible is true is if you have physical evidence that would support a great flood or if the earth is young. So um, we just can't willy-nilly say, well, you know, um, there's a change in nuclear structure. There is evidence, it's, it's not just evidence, it's pretty well accepted, that the continental crust has 70 times more uranium than on the seafloor or internal to the Earth. Either some really strange event just happened to sprinkle the continental crust <clears throat> with 70 times more uranium than anywhere else, else on the Earth, either sprinkle it, there's been kind of sprinkling theories, or any other sort of hypotheses that you know are, I think, personally questionable, or an event happened that synthesized it from scratch. There are physical experiments that claim uranium can be synthesized by electricity from scratch. <clears throat> if that's the case, this is a whole new ball game. We have a data point that does suggest something really strange happened that put 70 times more uranium on the continental crust than on the seafloor. Why is that? Um, okay, so now let's, so I gave you the nuclear transmutation in terms of electricity um, and lightning, and we have now mechanisms. So now let me cover some of the uh, developments some more. So these are high initiation nuclear reactions. This is well accepted. This is well accepted. Now we have what I'd call mixed energy nuclear reactions, where um, part of the system is in low energy, meaning uh, you're not using a lot of energy. It's just kind of just sitting there. And then you have parts that are um, very high energy, but it's focused. So if you look at the magnifying glass, ordinary sunlight normally just doesn't start a fire. But if you focus the sunlight with a magnifying glass, you can you can start a fire. <clears throat> and yes, I was kind of naughty when I was uh, a young boy. I, I, I really feel kind of guilty um, uh, looking in retrospect. I was a little bit cruel. I'd actually use the magnifying glass to see what would happen if I focused that beam of light and it hit an ant. And of course, these things would explode. And just a little boy's fascination is like, oh, that's cool. Look, it <laughs> I could make the ants explode. I, I feel kind of sorry now that I killed them. Um, it's kind of a cruel experiment. Oh, well, science marches forward. But <clears throat> anyway, this is a pyroelectric fusion device. It's actually low power. So remember, we assumed that we needed we needed tremendous gobs of energy to start off a, a fusion reaction. Well, if you're able to focus the energy, you could start with low power and just focus it, and you can make isolated fusion. So I don't know if you can see it in this photograph. There's kind of like a needle-like structure there. That is the focusing point of this system. And the way it works is, I'm sorry for the graph not being that good. Let me just move it and expand it here. Conceptually, you have that little needle here. You put heat into this crystal <clears throat> and that creates pyroelectricity, um, electricity caused directly by heat. And so when he throws heat into this, it'll create this burst of electricity. And then electricity goes into these deuterium, these hydrogen, these heavy hydrogen <clears throat> nuclei, and it will cause fusion. So this is an example. This is published in the, you can look it up. There's a Wikipedia entry on it. Let me see if I can even find it. Uh, You, you can look it up, look up pyroelectric fusion. See, I'm not 
BSing you here. They're able to get it at, at like temperatures down to 30 minus 36 degrees. So it's like, is that cold fusion? And I'm like, well, that's why I wouldn't call it cold fusion because the um, it's really kind of a misnomer to say cold or hot. It's the amount of energy in the reaction. It's, it's fair to say it's a, still a high energy reaction in one part, low energy in the other. That's why I call it mixed energy. That's probably the more accurate scenario. Cold and hot just ends up going into a just a kind of a needless debate here. But this pyroelectric fusion, as depicted here and confirmed, and I showed you the device that does it, uh, it's an accepted thing. So you can call it cold fusion, and this is just semantics if you're calling it cold or hot. It, I'd, I'd say mixed energy is the more accurate term. <clears throat> there has also been, okay, so, so let me go back a little bit here. There are various ways to generate electricity with a mechanical means. Normally, we just think about uh, an electric generator. There's something called like the Van de Graaff generator. You can make 500, you, it can get up to 5 million volts. And it just takes rubber and and um, rubs it against the metal ball. You get 5 million volts. This is actually um, the early method of making uh, nuclear accelerators, particle accelerators. So at most you could get 500 electron volts. That'd be the limit. You know, our big colliders now can get up into the terravolts, electron volt range. But th this uses what they call a, uh, yeah, five megavolts there. This uses what is called, um, Triboelectric. Triboelectric. Let me see if I can even find it. Tribo. The triboelectric effect. Oh, good night. The triboelectric effect. So that's just just using friction, you can generate huge amounts of voltage. Doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of power, okay? It's voltage. And this is where we have to get into electric magnetic theory to be able to make that distinction. And I'm not gonna go there today, maybe in another discussion. So we have um, triboelectric. So I discussed, I discussed um, pyroelectric, which is you're heating a crystal, you make electricity. It's one way. Triboelectric is you're rubbing just friction across. You can generate tremendous amounts of voltage. You actually experience the triboelectric effect on a very um, cold winter day and the air is not humid. Uh, you build up a lot of static electricity. That's the triboelectric effect. The uh, some numbers I've heard that the static electricity you develop in your bodies on the order of 30,000 volts, but because it doesn't have a lot of amperage, um, it's not lethal, even though it's up to 30,000 volts. And that's why you have to be very careful when you're servicing sensitive electronic equipment. The static discharge in your body could, could wipe out your, your chips. Uh, 30,000 volts is a lot. Now, it doesn't kill you because it doesn't have it's not backed by a lot of um, it's not. It has, it's not backed by a lot of electrons. So we, we might say you have high quality in terms of the voltage, but low quantity in terms of the number of electrons involved. That's why you don't die. Now, if that were 30,000 volts at one ampere, you'd be incinerated. Okay. Um, so it's probably on the order of nano to micro amperes. It's just thankfully merciful. So we have pyroelectricity, triboelectricity, we have piezoelectric. So piezoelectric is when you're compressing something, you create also electricity. And um, some of these lighters where you click the trigger, 
these butane lighters. I'm told that rather than kind of the flint spark, these are actually piezoelectric generated electrical sparks. So this is a known phenomenon. So you can imagine during, so the debate over, I talked about these earthquake lights. Let me see if I have it. Yes, I talked earlier about this phenomenon that is now becoming accepted as real, these earthquake lights uh, being the result of electrical electricity generated in the earth uh, in association in association with earthquakes. And the debate is, is this a piezoelectric or a triboelectric phenomenon or something or both or something else or mixed or we don't quite know. But let me read an article regarding the triboelectric effect and earthquake lights. And again, just, ex just except for the sake of argument, that is generating electricity. I've already pointed out when you can make lightning with this, you can start to change nuclear structure. This was not well accepted until now. This is why I've been very excited about all this because now there's an avenue for young earth creationism that wasn't there. And I've often said, just wait long enough, you might get an experiment that's gonna help you. So let me go to See if I have this article here. Yeah, here it is. And when I get around to it, I'm going to try to put this in the comment description, in the video description. So I'm just going to read it. When a magnitude 8.1 earthquake struck Mexico in 2017, Eerie images of green and blue lights in the sky popped up on social media. The so-called Mexico earthquake lights were yet another mysterious instance of phenomenon that has been puzzling, puzzling experts for hundreds of years. And there's a picture of the one of the pictures of this mysterious light. Like ball lightning, earthquake lights are rare, relatively rare, captivating, but hard but hard for scientists to explain. Complicating matters, the instances of luminosity around earthquakes don't all look the same, sparking theories that range from old lightning to UFOs and other worldly apparitions. The lights can take many different shapes, forms, and colors. Friedman Freud, an adjunct professor of physics at San Jose, Jose State University and senior researcher at NASA's Ames Research Center, said in a 2014 National Geographic interview. <clears throat> Freund and colleagues studied 65 accounts of such lights reaching as far back as six, 1600, publishing their fi findings in Seismology Research Letters 2014. Okay, I'm gonna skip all that. And so um, there's been a debate as what could cause it. <clears throat> Here are some more earthquake lights. And I'm not going to get into all the details. <clears throat> An early year study proposed that tectonic stress created a so-called piezoelectric effect in which quartz-bearing rocks produce strong electric fields when compressed in a certain way. But one of the complications in studying earthquake lights is, of course, that they're unpredictable and short-lived. In an attempt to work around this, some scientists have attempted to recreate the phenomenon in the lab. In a study led by a physicist at New Jersey's Rutgers University, where Dr. Dan teaches, by the way, and published in 2014, grains of different materials, flour, plastic discs, plaster, produced voltage spikes when agitated. The scientists attributed this friction between the grains, if this effect of friction between the grains, which would contradict both piezoelectric theory and Freund's. I didn't read what Freund's theory is. As long as conflicting scientific theories emerge, the debate over causes of earthquake lights stands to remain charged. I guess that's a pun 
intended. Now, as I said, you experience triboelectric effects all the time, like on cold winter days where it's not humid, uh, you know, the static discharge. And it is a little scary when I was um, filling up my car for gas. I get enough of a static discharge when I, you know, my key would touch certain surfaces. I'm just like, this doesn't feel good. Right when the gas is flowing, you know, I, I could I could start a fire this way. So that's most likely a triboelectric effect. Uh, even aircraft have these static discharge little tails on them, on their wings, their little antennas. Uh, I, I believe because as the aircraft flows through the air, it actually starts to accumulate charge too, and they have to try to discharge that. So the triboelectric effect is real. What we, um, what we don't real understand is, uh, you know, this experiment at Rutgers where they're just using ordinary grains and they were detecting voltage spikes. Yet on another level, we should not be entirely surprised. They are now suspecting this could also be an explanation for the electricity. But just suffice to say, when you can get lightning levels of electricity, uh, that can change nuclear structure. So that's not the end of the story. Um, so let me go now, let me kill this window. And I had one, the, the, there's this, I'm not, I don't, in the interest of time, the American Physical Society, which is the premier scientific society in the United States. I, I, I tend to think physics is, physics and chemistry are the top sciences. And the American Physical Society is the top physics society. Uh, they're mixing all these grains and trying to use, you know, experimenting in the lab. And they said, you know, they're using that as an explanation for um, <laughs> using it as an, I, I saw this, <laughs> no, it wasn't the gas prices. It was the triboelectric effect, which is described here. I was creating static electricity and I was seeing these static discharges right near right on my car. And I said, it's a good thing I didn't have a static discharge right there where the, uh, um, you know, where the, uh, where I was filling up the gas, <laughs> the opening for gas, I could have caused the fire. That would have been bad. Um, so we have this um, possible explanation then for the earthquake lightning. All right. But I don't know if we can actually calculate the magnitude of this anytime soon, but this is a heartening development. So I'm gonna get rid of this one. Um, that particular, I'm gonna get rid of that particular web page because I'm running out of time. So let's see, I did talk about pyroelectric fusion already. Since we covered that, I'm gonna kill that page. Let me see what else I had on the, I talked about the Van de Graaff generator, which uh, talks about, which illustrates the triboelectric effect. I'm just going through what I needed to talk about. And let me see, the very big developments. Yeah, this is one of them. So we're able to compress rocks, right? And make electricity. They're able to generate neutrons with this. This is from the IEEE. I was a member of the IEEE. It's the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Oh, greetings, Cheryl. Uh, we're in the middle of a nerd torture session. So thanks for joining us. Any joining us anyway, Cheryl. So this is the title of the paper, High Voltage Piezoelectric System for Generating Neutrons. So what they're able to do basically is, is, is leverage this whole thing of compressing a rock, making electricity, and then making that part of the system that would generate neutrons, and then you could change nuclear structure. Now, isn't that cool? This was like this paper. Let's see if I can get a timeline on it.
I don't know uh, when this was published. Two thousand thirteen. Two thousand thirteen, and that was a year after I gave my graduate school term paper. Had I known this, I would have included it. This is a big deal. You're compressing rocks, making. You're compressing a rock, making neutrons, changing nuclear structure. Do you take, okay, this is an ex, this is definitely an exaggeration, but just imagine pounding a rock. You might be making neutrons, okay? I, it's doubtful, but they figured out how to do kind of the essentially that. It, it, it's a rare phenomenon where you can basically pound the rock enough to make neutrons, but they described the mechanisms. So the, the compression of the rock creates electricity. The electricity then is focused. Uh, the electricity then can... Um, uh, as we know, when you generate enough electricity, you can cause photonuclear effects. The photonuclear effects can generate neutrons. Neutrons can then do all sorts of things to change nuclear structure. So, so those of you, whether you believe in hydroplate theory, catastrophic plate tectonics, or some other tectonic uh, theory for the explanation of Noah's flood and all the things associated, you know there's going to be lots of stress and strain. If it's triboelectric, piezoelectric, you have electricity, you can make neutrons. This is proof positive it can be done, at least in principle. Whether it can be extrapolated to, to an Earth flood system remains to be seen. But this is a big breakthrough that we can change nuclear structure with just compression. Um, What's the best flood geology model? I would say to be determined. I, there are elements of Walter Brown's theory, which gave me some ideas about uh, hydroplate theory I liked because it dealt with nu this nuclear idea. I guess catastrophic can also deal with that, but this is a big deal. Okay, so for the skeptics out there, I've given several instances of mixed energy nuclear reactions. We can call it cold fusion, but I don't like that term, okay? Because part of it's hot, part of it's cold. All right, so um, otherwise it's gonna get into a meaningless debate over semantics. This can happen at low energy from the outside, but then it's focused into high energy, just like a magnifying glass. So is a magnifying glass a low or high energy system? It's just like, well, you know, the input may be low, but if it's focused, it can be high. So it becomes a semantic debate. So let's, you know, I don't want to go there. So, so I'm going to kill this page. I'm going to try to put all these links to these papers in the video description uh, when I get around to it. I'm glad all of, some of you are out here to give me an audience. I, you know, as I said, I was very sick. I had to, I ended up sleeping during the day, during the day because I was very sick. I overworked, um, suffered. BPPD, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And I knew I had to just lie down and just take it easy. Now I can't sleep now that I've woken up. So I figured I'd do a stream. Now this paper, nuclear reaction is obser observed in Bremsterolong. Nuclear, novel nuclear reactions observed in Bremsterolong irradiated deuterated materials. Okay, that was a mouthful. This paper, I think, is, let me see if I have a date on it. I seem to recall, okay, there are some things here citing 2020. This may be a 2021 paper. Oh, here it is. July, June, 2020. Yeah, um, and Cheryl was asking, do I, I hope, hope I feel better? Yes, praise God. Although the BPPV was really scary because the room just started to spin. That's caused by uh, what they call canalith magnesium crystals just floating around. And if you're in the wrong orientation, uh, it'll make the, I, it was pretty scary. I've had bouts of this. So 
could be my flying days are done since I've had, you know, I could probably still fly, uh, but I can't do it when I've had a recent about a BPPV. But anyway, so I gave you the piezoelectric. This one is also very interesting. Remember, lightning can create, it can create X-rays, it can create gamma rays. Um, and we talked about how the plate movement can create electricity. Good evidence of that. Do we have adequate, is the electricity at adequate quality? Probably. 100 million volts is going to give you enough to make nuclear reactions. Uh, you only, you know, you need, uh, many of these photonuclear processes can even happen at like, say, like three and a half mega electron volts. Uh, so uh, you, have, you have adequate voltage to pull this off. So what this experiment did is they took um, they took electricity and made gamma rays. Um, and the gamma rays were then used to um, make neutrons, fast moving neutrons. The neutrons would hit the deuterium, uh, the hydrogen, the heavy hydrogen nuclei. Then the heavy hydrogen nuclei would then collide with a stationary, quote unquote stationary, relatively stationary hydrogen nuclei. So again, you have kind of the, the stationary, which I would call the stationary, which I would call <clears throat> low energy, and the moving, which I'd call high energy. Lack of a better word, you can kind of call it temperature. Sometimes we do measure temperature in electron volts. For plasmas, it, it just makes more sense. Uh, temperature is just a tough topic, by the way. So you have something in the cold state, something in the hot state. It's moving along fast, intercepts it. You have nuclear fusion. You're able to create uh, new elements. And how this can play out to make heavy elements, we don't know, because right now we're just toying around with low elements. But we're now starting to see it's becoming feasible to do this. You have, you have adequate electricity to make nuclear reactions. The one with the piezoelectric was really powerful. Let me get a drink here. The one with the piezoelectric was really powerful because you're just almost just pounding rocks and you can make neutrons. This one did use traditional electricity, but I will point out for those interested, the um, the vials where they, they, they were doing some of this, they were measuring the electric current, it was in the microampere range. Okay, so <clears throat> your light bulbs, 100 watt light bulb roughly, probably about an ampere. They're able to do these nuclear reactions at microamperes, millionths, an order of a millionth of what you're getting in your light bulb. So um, it is, it is, it is um, low energy in the sense it's not really a lot of energy, but it's very, very focused like a magnifying glass. It's just pointed. And <clears throat> I'm just saying this, these are very heartening developments. So let me see what else is on my docket here. So I'm going to try to put that in the video description link. This is beginning to give a trail of how compression create, can create nuclear reactions. <clears throat> and if you think about it, even the, the first atomic bomb was basically a compression reaction. You're forcing uranium together at high speed and it creates a fission reaction. That's really the first low energy nuclear, low initiation energy nuclear reaction, just putting things together. <clears throat> And we'll go into the electromagnetics of this at some in some of the real nerd culture sessions, because I'm throwing a lot of terms like electron volts, etc. And Ben Rex, if you're listening, this is right in your alley. Um, understanding all of the, you know, I'm using a lot of both electromagnetic theory terms to explain nuclear physics here. <clears throat> so I talked about the pyroelectric fusion device, and the one I just covered, the term for it is lattice-enabled nuclear reaction. 
So <clears throat> I've shown we've definitely proven mixed energy nuclear reactions, the kind that are relevant to young earth creationism. Um, I should point out there's, there's a subtlety to this where we get into the territory that is not really well understood. It was mentioned a little bit in the lattice assisted nuclear reaction, which I just covered. <clears throat> the electron <clears throat> is, you know, um, the Bohr atom has the electron orbiting. The more modern version of the atom is that it's kind of just spread out in space. And so um, let me highlight this article. This gets into quantum mechanics a little bit. And, and they ask, why don't electrons in the atom enter the nucleus? And the answer from this professor here is that electrons are always partially in the nucleus. Electrons are always partially in the nucleus. And this is because of quantum mechanics, you know, where things, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where, you know, space positional, the position of the electron is not well defined. Um, if you have, if you have um, a good idea of its momentum, you, you don't have a good idea of its position and vice versa. And so hypothetically, the, the electron is partially in the nucleus, or you could say if you, if you, at some point in time, it will be inside the nucleus. And this leads to some Schrodinger cat kind of strangeness there. But this is important because there are now, you can say there are situations where if that's the case, in a sense, you know, uh, the nucleus could be, um, have not quite say a full positive charge, all right? This is what they call electron screening. And you don't, it doesn't have to be electrons. It could be a, a, a negatively charged particle called a muon. So one of the first examples of, of quote unquote cold fusion, and I hate that word, low energy fusion was muon catalyzed fusion. Let me see if I have a article on that. And here it is, it's a Wikipedia article. You could read it. I cited it in my graduate term paper that infamous graduate term paper that kind of made me become more of a young earth creationist. Muon catalyst, this is the Wikipedia entry. Muon catalyzed fusion is a process allowing nuclear fusion to take place at temperatures significantly lower than the temperatures required for thermonuclear fusion. Even at room temperature or lower, it is one of the few known ways of catalyzing nuclear fusion reactions. And, and I want to say, it used to be a few ways. We're learning more. I already gave you several examples, piezoelectric, um, pyroelectric, and then lattice-assisted nuclear reactions. These are all kind of, you know, externally speaking, low, low, low energy, or really more mixed energy. The muon catalyzed fusion, um, and I, I I'm unfortunately have to go into a little, little nuclear theory to, to explain why this is significant. So just suffice to say, this is a real thing. This is cold fusion. Um, this is cold fusion. So do I have a graph? Yes. So the problem is like when you have two positively charged magnets, I mean, not pos if you have two magnets and they're, um, you know, and you try to push together when they're both like say both North and North pole or South and South pole. Okay. If it's North and South, they'll attract, they stick together. If they're north and north or south and south, they, they'll repel. That's an analogy to what happens when you have positive, two positive charges. So you have a positive hydrogen nucleus, another positive hydrogen nucleus, 
when you try to push them together, it takes, you have to apply force or they have to come together at a very high velocity so that they can get just close enough that they can fuse together uh, where the strong nuclear forces will then allow them to bind and then you can form a new atom. So that's why all of the fusion like in the atomic in the hydrogen bomb had to be hot you used enough heat and the molecules are because it's so hot they're moving at high speed and you get collisions that are fast enough that you can cause a fusion reaction and and hence generate new kinds of atoms new new atoms not new kinds but atoms that didn't exist before uh, you said we call it nucleosynthesis well I'm going to show a diagram here, and this is purely conceptual. But in the blue here, so the normal situation is you need a lot of speed to get the positive and the positive to join. But what if you have a negative charge in the nucleus? Remember, I said quantum mechanically, you can, the electron sometimes can be in the nucleus. And any physicist out there, please correct me on how I'm phrasing this. But also, you can have a muon passing through. You just need the muon to pass through or the electron to be here at just the right time. And then now this gets to be a neutral charge. And that lowers, <laughs> you don't need all that high energy to bring them together. The muon catalyzed fusion, and again, this is just a really gross simplification. Um, I'm not endorsing that this is the actual model, but, but the idea is when you can throw negative charges, somehow get them close to the nucleus position just right, you can change. It's uh, You can put the muons there, get this fusion reaction to happen at low temperature. I, I gave you the wiki article that said this can happen happen at room temperature or lower. Now, the, the trick is, can we use electrons in this way? And that's where the debate is. The experiment I cited earlier, where they had microamperes, the lattice-assisted, the one conducted by NASA, the NASA experiment used this phenomenon. The, la the NASA experiment used this phenomenon where they're getting, they call it electron screening where you're getting the electrons in a position such that you lower the you lower the net charge of the nucleus the effective charge you don't actually change the charge but the, the net result is is it is as if the nucleus had a lower positive charge then you can merge them together so this is a very complex this is a, a very complex reaction you're using electricity to generate neutrons. The neutrons bounce against hy some hydrogen, free-floating hydrogen atoms, and the others are in what they call a, a lattice. It'll either be titanium or uh, erbium, or I don't, the atomic symbol ER. The hydrogen's in there, kind of in a lattice, and these high-speed uh, hydrogen nuclei then collide with the stationary ones. But the stationary ones are surrounded by electrons to reduce the coolant, what they call the Coulomb barrier, to reduce the effective positive charge. The reaction can happen at a lower energy. And so this is an example of a, um, of a lower energy nuclear reaction. And I pointed out, we have all these trails of experiments now, particularly the piezoelectric neutron generator as I said, kind of in a comical way, you're using a hammer, using a hammer and you're making neutrons. Okay, that's obviously an exaggeration, but I want you to get that picture using a hammer to make neutrons, changing nuclear structures. Ridiculous as that sounds, I'm going to go to an experiment now. Now that I've given you the experimental trail of how this, how the mechanism could be elucidated, I'll give you the controversial, the more controversial ones, but maybe it will make you. I'm just trying to say this might make it more believable. Now, Stephen Jones, 
was one of the pioneers of muon catalyzed fusion. He really did pioneer the work on the first confirmed low temperature, the first cold fusion reaction, which was with muons. Some of his later work was controversial where he was using electrons to uh, lower, um, to create lower energy fusion. That has not been accepted by the mainstream. So one experiment, one of his experiments on cold fusion was accepted. It was muon catalyzed. The ones with electrical, with using electrons in chemistry, that has been rejected. But, you know, now that we've had these later experiments at the NASA uh, research, Glenn Research Institute in Ohio, as recently as 2020, this is recent stuff. And then plus the thermo, the thermonuclear, the thermo, I'm sorry, the photonuclear processes of lightning. You could see this is widening the spectrum of options for young earth creationism to explain the changes, the proportions of parent and daughter products. The radiometric dating problem is now, you know, I wouldn't say the other side, I wouldn't say the young earth creationists have won, but the other side definitely now has more to think about and to account for, and they can't write us off as easily. And as I said, they may have a purely scientific reason for exploring this outside of just fighting over creation evolution, because we have 70 times more uranium in the continental crust than we do in the mantle or seafloor. This could explain it. Ironically, if anyone in the secular world pursues this, they will actually solve potentially a problem for young earth creationism, and that's why I'm excited. That's why, despite this clunky presentation, I said, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and post this, because later this week, I'm going to talk to an old, earth, an old earth geochemist, and I promised I'd give him a fair audience, meaning I'm, I'm going to say, uh, Dr. John, you know I strenuously and vociferously disagree with your viewpoint. I'm going to give you the floor to just make your best case. That's the fair and responsible thing to do. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people on the net want to see one side win and fight, and that's not the way this channel is organized because it's very hard to explore these topics in adequate depth in, like, say, a one-hour debate format. It's just ridiculous to expect that the problems of creationism and the universe will be solved in one hour. Come on, guys. So that's why I'm coming out now and saying, you know, I'm going to give someone else that has a definitely stronger, <clears throat> a definitely st strong viewpoint against mine to come this coming Wednesday to make his case. And I promised I'm not going to interrupt him. I'll, I'll let him speak as I did, as I did Dr. Dan when he presented his presentation on phylogeny. I'm going to give, I'm going to give uh, Dr. John, who graciously offered to give his viewpoint and so this is my this is my counter before what he says, just to show it's not as airtight. But I, I, I owe him the courtesy and I owe it to my audience, especially the graduate students, the science students who are Christians and creationists, to hear the other side, because um, you may hear this in school and you may have to wrestle with it. So this is a good place to, to have it discussed. So let me see, I'm almost done. Okay. So Stephen Jones did get this published, I'm presuming because his reputation at the time, it's not so good now, but at the time, because of his work on muon catalyzed fusion, his pioneering work on actually some of the first, some of the first, he wasn't the first, but some of the first cold fusion reactions with muon catalyzed, he talked about chemically catalyzed fusion. It did get published in Nature. He speculated this is the cause of tritium being found in volcanoes. To be fair, I think um, it's doubtful that we actually found tritium in the volcanoes. It's not confirmed. I wouldn't appeal to that, although he's put it forward as a theory. However, I've cited experiments that have essentially vindicated his viewpoints that some of this stuff can happen at low, lower energies in mixed energy, well, proper term would be mixed energy, somewhat lowered energy due, due to electron screening. And so, 
Um, oh my, that's it. That's it for now. We talked an awful lot. I hope this is encouraging. Um, this doesn't mean young earth creationism's out of the wood, not by woods, not by a mile, but it is, I think this is a hopeful sign, a sign that we're looking for. And as I said, um, uh, I'm interested in this. I began to be a young earth creationist because I saw the problems with chemical dating. I saw problems with the big bang, planetary evolution, and I felt that the mainstream had told me basically told me a myth that they are unable to defend, especially now seeing that abiogenesis theory is totally fallen apart. You could extend the statistics to eukaryotic evolution. And like, I think, I think now it's becoming a fair fight. Um, and the trend has been favorable to young earth creationism being true. Um, despite what you may hear in the mainstream, things are moving fast. And I've had the privilege of, um, just partly thank God because of Google, I'm able to have access that I didn't have before to find out about physical experiments that have been ignored. Oh, now I remember what I wanted to talk about. There is a famous, so we talked about muon catalyzed fusion. See, I had all these web things queued up and the muon, uh, the uh, cold fusion and condensed matter. This is a very interesting experiment. And person, John Bachris. Let me. Patrick Bernhardt, Bernhardt Patrick John Omara Bachris was a South African professor of chemistry, laterally at Texas A&M University. During his long and prolific career, he published some 700 papers and two dozen books. He is, he's, his best known work is in electrochemistry, but his output also extended to environmental chemistry, photoelectric chemistry, and bioelectric chemistry. In the 1990s, he experimented with cold fusion and transmutation topics on which his unorthodox views provoked controversy. So now that you've heard about, again, an exaggeration, the hammering on rocks making neutrons, that IEEE, that experiment in the IEEE on the piezoelectric neutron generator. Okay, I call that the hammering on rocks neutron generator, the piezoelectric neutron generator. Um, that is a confirmed experiment, and that's backed also by other experiments now, like the one in 2020 on the lattice-enabled nuclear reactions uh, at the NASA Glenn Research Center. So in light of that, let me explain Bakris's claims. Bakris, um, as I said, you could tell, 700 publications. James Tour has 700 publications. So Bakris is a distinguished professor of chemistry, respected up until he delved into cold fusion. And, and what happened is he had these explosion experiments. Um, and then he examined the containers afterward and he synthesized gold. So he claims, claims he synthesized gold, not, not large amounts of gold, parts per million. He would send it off to a laboratory after the explosions were done. You sent it off to the laboratory and you get a few atoms of gold per million. Now that's not a lot, but uh, being that chemistry was his specialty, uh, I'm presuming that he knew who to talk to, to establish it was contamination and what lab uh, he didn't do the test for the uh, composition himself. He sent it off to another laboratory, uh, other independent laboratories, to test the results of his explosion experiments. So remember, um, this whole thing about both piezoelectric and triboelectric, it can generate enough electricity 
to create photonuclear processes and even create neutrons. We don't know what else can go on. And he was, he was deeply criticized that these things are absurd. I'm trying to point out, we now have experimental evidence that's kind of building kind of the, the stairway of explanations of how this reactions are not trivial. Uh, the, the pathway is not trivial for this reaction to happen, um, but it could. And I, I would hope it would spark more interest in kind of the uh, kind of the compression, the compression methods of making neutrons and changing nuclear structure, because that would be associated with Noah's flood. So, I, I you know, I, I think, I, 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 I think the field is ripe, and I hope that this will spark some young Earth creationists, students out there interested in physics, not to feel intimidated. This is an area where you can make a big contribution to science, secular science. And I cited some experiments that were big contributions to secular science and perhaps to even clean energy. Um, I know that's gonna be a political debate because I don't know that we necessarily wanna have nuclear powered cars because this would be nuclear proliferation times a zillion. Um, but this could lead to all sorts of novelties in, in nuclear energy, for better or worse, sadly. Um, but the more important thing for the Christian faith is this may establish that the world is young. And I think most people understand if we're able to establish the world is young, that would indicate that a literal interpretation of the Gospel of Luke, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, um, can be literally interpreted and is therefore historical. This would be evidence that the Christian scriptures are inspired by God himself and that Jesus is who he said he was. And um, that's why I'm hopeful on many levels. Um, in these troubled times, this is th these are comforting facts. So with that, I really wish to thank everyone who has uh, who has joined this discussion and at this strange hour, and it's been a delight. And I will uh, post a um, uh, a link. I'll post a video, an upcoming video, an announcement to the upcoming video I'll be doing with John B. shortly. So thank you again for joining us uh, today. Take care and the Lord richly bless you. Have a good night.